but I just, I, especially in the past year, have really discovered the force of love and how it drives every great thing that I do in my life. And without the love and support of my friends, my family, my bus driver who stops when I run, and I give up, and then he still waits for me. <laughs> um, but like, love is such an important thing in our lives. And self-love, and then kind of making sure that you find the strength within yourself to forgive and to push other people in your lives. It's a really powerful force. And so I love Galentine's because I just get to tell you all how much you mean to me. Um, and even if I've never met you before, you being in this room as an act of love for art, for this bookstore, for yourself. And it means so much to us that we have people coming and participating and being a part of our family. So, happy Galentine's, eat all the candy, floss before you go to sleep, <laughs> and enjoy yourselves tonight. Um, so, I'm also really excited. It's um, Black History Month, and Malvern is such a wonderful store. In addition to our ice cream social display, which they let us put up every time we do ice cream social, they have this amazing Black History Month display with incredible uh, black writers and poets. Um, so, I definitely recommend checking that out. Um, uh, we put on our ice cream social display Patricia Smith and Donica Kelly, because, or Denika Kelly, excuse me. Uh, they just won both of them an incredible award. If you don't know about them, I definitely recommend their poetry. Uh, that's my plug for shopping at, ice cream, at the ice cream social, Malvern Books. Um, and I'm also really excited because this month we're going to be featuring uh, a really great organization in the Austin community, Speak Peace. Um, they use spoken word poetry as a way to encourage leadership, uh, comprehension, um, communication, and just like learning our talents and learning our power to youth uh, in our community through spoken word. Um, and I think we can all agree that right now uh, the youth in this country are better leaders than our public officials. And so I'm really jazzed about uh, supporting an organization that is supporting the youth of our community. So. Our three featured readers tonight are all going to be uh, members of that um, awesome organization. So I'm super excited about that. Yeah, I guess without further ado, we should introduce our open mic, which is always, I'm so proud and so grateful y'all share your work with us. Um, starting, uh, coming up first, I don't know how to speak. I, <laughs> I got a degree in English and it's not working. It's more of a written yeah. thing. <laughs> <laughs> so our first open mic for tonight has attended a few and has a few ice cream socials and always blows me away. I'm so excited to introduce Kirsten. Yeah. Alrighty, everybody give it up for our hosts. They're so gracious and I just love them. So it's actually really funny that I was trying to write a poem and I couldn't decide which one I wanted to write, which one I wanted to perform, and with the theme being love, uh, this is kind of about the acceptance of it. So, 10 ways to tell my conservative father that I'm in love with girls. And what I mean by that is that I believe women are made of starlight and spring and magic, while men have historically been vitally important for our biological reproduction. <laughs> Number one, this poem. I mean, I can always slap a stamp on it and drop it in the mailbox, right? And maybe if I perform it enough times, he'll hear it. Maybe I won't even have to tell him, and he'll just know what I am, like the sky is blue. Number two, I would tell him in whispers, soft summer breezes will carry off the lake as we sat around our childhood campfire roasting s'mores and gently rubbing each other. His new son will effuse animalistic squawks from the core of his being before falling out of his chair in response to a tasteless and quite frankly offensive joke told at someone else's expense. Birds will take flight in the night and my eyes will glance over the places where I have buried the old parts of myself in these vacant woods. His new wife and daughter will engage in gossip, ignoring my seat per usual. My father will make half-hearted attempts to include me in our imaginary trip because he is expected to. While I am caught in the middle, an observer to their new life, I will thank him as he hands me a beer. I will find courage among the stars and wood smoke and I will whisper my truth while he pretends he never heard it. I will wonder how he would feel if I pointed out the graveyard I made of this land. 
My confession will drift quietly towards those cold pinpricks of light, but he'll understand when I bring a partner to holiday events and he calls in my roommate like I never outgrew dorm room bunks. Number three. I tell him at the top of a roller coaster while my anxiety threatens to tear my heart through my spine before the weight of confession sets in. I'll be more scared of telling him than of the drop, the climb, the timeline, tick, tick, ticking the seconds until the truth is ripped from my lungs. I have always been terrified of heights, but there's no fear I have ever known like being honest with my father. In this moment, I will find some shred of courage before the floor falls out from under me. I hope we would hug after the ride and he would offer the acceptance I know to live without. I will cry into his shoulder as he rubs my back, a familiar dance of comfort. I will tell him of my terror and the shame I carried for so long like cinder blocks at sea. I know he may be shell-shocked, stunned for the rest of the ride. I know he'll do his best John Wayne impersonation, walking towards the sunset as if the channels I filled with my own tears, with my own blood, were swam in pre preparation for this loss. Number four. I show him the suicide notes I wrote as a teenager. I don't think I ever felt like following through but when you carry secrets deeper than realization allows, it can make you hate even your fingernails. I'd been standing on the edge of the precipice as if it were a friend's doorstep. I dared not jump from the great nothing, a welcome and terrifying possibility. I would tell him how we were the Perrys, and I would have been the youngest member of the Dead Poets Society. So soften the blow. Maybe the shock of him almost losing his child would show him to reason. Most likely, he will brand me selfish and see me only as a reflection of the earth in which I grew. Number five, I scream it in his face in a drunken rage outside our favorite Mexican joint because he said some really fucked up shit about immigration and refugees, and you know what? This was the time it really got under my skin. I mean, are we not all humans deserving of love and respect? This was the time I snapped, storming out the second the check was paid. I lay to him in the parking lot, and neither one of us is fair, but it will provide the fuel we need to ignore each other for the rest of our lives. After all, I carry his stubbornness and his temper. On our deathbeds, we will finally confess if we only had enough time, we would have made things right. Number six, I invite him to my wedding and he doesn't walk me down the aisle. I never get a daughter dance. He ends up leaving before I even take a step towards my future, storming out as he realizes I'm marrying a woman. You're just like your mother, he will spit in my face. I won't have the words to tell him how right he is. Number seven, we build a treehouse in his backyard while caught up in make-believe in dreams. I will tell him my secrets through the tin can phone we made, reverence filling my voice as he laughs, saying he cannot hear me. I'll respond in kind and tell him that I prefer ponytails over braids, and he'll remind me of how much I love weaving my own hair. I'll mistake this as acceptance, and he will never hear. Number eight. I tell him over the phone so I don't have to see his face. The hurt and rejection will play across my borrowed features, but I can feign ignorance at least. He'll tell me I'm not the daughter he raised from the lips that sit below my mother's nose. I will remind him he didn't raise me. Being present in my life doesn't constitute an active role. Number nine, I would reveal my heart to him in a letter. Details would run along teardrops, my hand looping hieroglyphic puzzles, chronicling every instance in which I knew but was frozen in his disapproval. I will tell him of my flippantly scabbed knees in the endless softball tournaments, not to be a stereotype. I will tell him of the time I messaged my childhood best friend a lifetime ago when exploration was all I knew, telling her of the girl I was curious about as if I was asking her permission for pursuit. I couldn't pretend not to love her even then. I will tell him that at 14, my party trick was a gaydar that never failed and the courage I found at 23 to admit why. I want my confession to be hard to throw away. I want to leave him with some piece of me when he no longer wants me. I imagine he would go back to the note in moments of turmoil to feel my guilt and pain echoed in his own heart, the grief and shame I carried within for so long over who I am and who I could not mold myself to be. And I will not want him to carry my sorrow. Darlings, only I can do that. What I crave is his understanding. I will tell him the real reason his votes anger me. I will tell him that before I knew why, I felt every malicious word he turned against my, mom, my mother like a dagger in my own heart. I will tell him of my hurts, not to invite the guilt to the table, but to bloom in front of him in the hopes of forgiveness. My voice will shake from fear. I will offer my forgiveness. How can I blame him for planting his hateful seeds when he knew nothing of their root in me? I don't want him to think I hate all of him, just the stubborn parts that refuse to yield, the parts I have no home in, the rotted bits I dug out with fire and fury. Lastly, I will apologize for imagined wrongs because I will feel like I have to. Even now, I still feel the need to apologize for my love. Number 10. I don't. We've grown into strangers forever peering through fog in each other's vague forms across waves neither one of us wants to traverse. I doubt he would be able to see past my resemblance of my mother and her steel, steady heart. 
I carry her spirit within me, and that is too much for him to bear, even without him knowing. We wear strangers' faces now, but I can see the hint of my crooked teeth in his infrequent smiles. He was a pillar I built my life on. What will become of me when stone melts to sand? I was born from this red earth, soaked in lies and betrayal. I have found that it is no way to live, shrouded in fear and disgrace. I want to tell him I have found love and forgiveness. I want to paint my truth in the sky, but lies by omission don't really count as lies, right? Thank you. Rock, paper, scissors, no. <laughs> Thank you. <coughs> All right, so quickly about what this poem is. Um, I was reading, a, it was, I was on LinkedIn, was reading some articles. There was one about a, like a Wells Fargo survey where they were talking about, you know, like 16% of all millennials age 23 to like 37 of those of that group 16 percent have saved like over a hundred grand and I, over here i was thinking like that's fantastic like that's great and i started reading the comments and i wrote this poem instead <laughs> <laughs> all right who mad bro you mad what is this nonsense tearing down generations every year there are new iterations of children who will grow up and start to have lives and whether that's fancy or in dives, who are you to judge what we're doing with our time? You're not happy when millennials are lazy. Your views are getting really hazy when you yell on social media about those who have saved a hundred grand and more. What the hell are you so, why are you so sore? You can scream at your peers, the ones that raise the kids that don't fit your mold. Life is delayed, careers aren't the same. Good homes are expensive, birthing children is on hold. <coughs> And the internet made us bold. Most of our parents love and support us, the good ones disciplined, but still made a fuss to make sure that we had what we need to survive. Let me be the one to tell you, we're self-sustaining and self-actualized. That means we should all learn from one another, the old from the young, the young from the old, instead of drifting further. So stop marginalizing a group of people you don't understand, and we need to do a better job of respecting those who are now considered grand. And seriously, what both the boomers and millennials need to worry about is helping the generation of Tide Pod eaters to experience life with fewer doubts. <laughs> faster than I can Instagram, which is like a very millennial problem, I guess. <laughs> Thank you, Anissa. Up next, the person who doesn't need an introduction, but I'll introduce her as the ultimate ice cream socialist. Alison Whipple. <laughs> I'm apparently all about the haiku this year, so I'm going to read uh, more haiku. Like I did last month, but they're new. Most of them. Riverbed craters, new terrain emerging across my face. Riverbed craters, new terrain emerging across my face. Gutted tennis ball, filled with paper flowers, colors run in rain. Gutted tennis ball, filled with paper flowers, colors run in rain. Two cop cars speed past yellow stoplights holding a wake of vultures. Two cop cars speed past yellow stoplights holding a wake of vultures. Gray kingbird feasting on an unseen harvest among stripped branches. Gray kingbird feasting on an unseen harvest among stripped branches. It's been a while, so 
bear with me. So much hate flows from your mouth that the medievals would cut your tongue out. If beauty is in the eye of the beholder, then what the fuck are you looking at? Maybe it's just me and I'm different, but to me, beauty is in the imperfection. Don't take that the wrong way because you're gorgeous, my dear, but it's the imperfection that is you, the uniqueness is what we yearn for, but in its presence we cower, what finicky creatures of habit we are. Always wanting to be one of a kind, then bashing the qualities that qualify us, saying that we're happy with ourselves, looking for others to implore our confidence, only to shove fingers down our throats the moment we get behind closed doors because they say beauty comes in sizes, and like fashion changes, this year's a double zero. But I beg you to please believe me. Beauty isn't about that, it's not a number, it's not a color, it's not a brand, it's nothing society says it is. Because society is wrong, it's sick. Killing itself over face paint and fabric, numbers and names of corporations. But you're better than that, you're unique. One of a kind from your head to your toes, each little freckle, those sweet southern dimples, lovely curves and even the squint of your nose. Each scar life has left is just another beauty mark. Each beauty mark is one, once an adventure. Some good, some bad, but all in all, a part of you and your beauty. Wear it with pride for the good times. Reminders for when, where you've been, what all you've conquered, and the sights that you've seen. Even the scars of a dark past bring beauty. They mark the strength to conquer fear, the courage to continue on no matter what. Beauty may be in the eye of the beholder, but you must remember one thing. Some beholders are blind by their imperfections and will do all they can to blur them from vision. Through hateful words and nasty stares, I feel far sorry for these poor souls, for they know not what beauty is. All right, so we have one more open micer, but if you feel compelled, feel free to let us know and we'll make room for you. Our final open micer we just met tonight, I'm so excited to introduce. in the words of Emily du Chatelet, I fucked Voltaire, got money, try me. <laughs> I don't speak French, so I might be paraphrasing, but who's to say she didn't say that? Emily was the first to translate Newton's Principia into French, proofs and all, all while married and fucking Voltaire on the side, using his name in the byline not as necessity but notoriety, well, actually more more necessity, and if that isn't the most bossiest thing I've ever heard. Speaking of bossy, Laura Bossy was the first woman to earn professorship in the world. Scratch that back, in the world. A physicist, an academic, a mother of 12, but she lost seven, taught out of the home, her first dissertation out of 31, let me rewind that back, out of 31, de aqua corpore naturali elemento Aliorum corporum parte university, which roughly translate to, in my opinion, they may see me as token, but I won't be broken by these motherfuckers. I don't speak Italian, so who's to say she didn't say that? Um, and if that's not the most courageous thing I've ever heard, courageous, curious, curious. Speaking of Marie Curie, the first radioactive woman who subsequently inspired a century of superhero stories, had an affair with a married constituent. The public called her siren, a witch, inferior, but she went on to win two Nobel Prizes. Her response, quote, be less curious about people and more curious about ideas and fuck the haters. I don't speak Polish, so who's to say she didn't say that? And if that is the fiercest thing I've ever heard, speaking of fear, speaking of fear, I, I lied. I can speak a little Polish, French, and Italian. Um, arete, por favore fermati, prosciette, postagne, please stop. These women walked into labs and lecture halls with insecurity, inferiority, and their sexuality hanging from their skirts like clothes doused in gasoline, and understand that they were walking into room with lit torches. And if these men turned away when they spoke of the energy of gravity and water, a place where science is common language, how would they respond to words like stop, can't, wait, don't, please, 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 I don't know, 
maybe we're not speaking the same language. Mm -hmm.